readers here at the Peralta Hacienda Historical House. Um, in fact, I'm one of the people who helped do the training. So this video is to give you a few guidelines on things that might work well. When you bring somebody into the house, you're talking about the museum. And the major theme of our museum is that this is a place where cultures came together. So we start with the kitchen, and that's where we are now. And some things to remember when you talk about the kitchen is things are basically set up in a few areas. There's this table, the table there, and here. Uh, these represent the different cultures and the ways, the foods that they were familiar with, the culture that they knew, and how they used foods. So this is those Spanish settlers who first came over to the New World, the things they were familiar with from Europe, the Middle East, and Asia and Africa, and it even says it right along there. Once they got over to this side of the world, they met other people and they learned things from Central America and Mexico. And then finally, we, not finally, because we talk about the Native American. We have this small little section. There's actually a wider range of foods, but we want to just emphasize that their foods were very much connected to the seasons, what fruits, vegetables, things were in season. And when the fish were running, they connected themselves to that. So while they weren't farmers in the traditional sense, they very much knew what was going on. The fourth category for that would be our current neighbors, people who live around the neighborhood. And you can see from this example of all the different people who are featured in our cookbook that we have all cultures and backgrounds, ethnicities, people who have different ways of providing food. They all come together in this area. So that is the big focus when you're here in the kitchen. An important thing to remember when you're doing the tour is surrounding you in every room are all kinds of little clues and things. Personally, I like to think of it as the things that I think are neat, the things that get my interest in the room. So if you find yourself in ever being stuck with what to talk about next, you can always just look around you. So as the museum was designed, the house took on a whole different character, and it's nice to kind of take a look at this. In 1897, the house is moved to where it is now. So it's actually on the land, but it was a little farther off. And you can see through these pictures how things change so that by the time you get to the end of the 70s, somebody has remembered it. It had been turned into an apartment house, and then it had just been sort of left. <laughs> and they decided to create a park, and the people said, well, wait a minute, but that's a historical site. And they did the background, and they found out about it, and then they started to raise money so that they created the park, and they fixed the house up and did a whole restoration. And that brings us up to 2009, when the museum was created. It's always nice to let people know that the museum is part of a big restoration that was done to the house. Um, and folks who are serious historians can get really finicky about that. Um, it's important to let people know that we have done a restoration, we've done a recreation. We have not been able to get exactly everything, so a lot of the stuff that's in the house are replicas so that you get a feel for how it was then. There's very few in that, things in the house that are authentic of the period and few things that were actually in the house in that era. But a lot of it is being recreated. And so we love to kind of brag about that a little bit to show you how somebody can create a feel for what the house was originally without having those original materials. We, we can't afford redwood. But we can get a nice wood and then have somebody do a texture on it so that we can see what it was like. So we're, we're kind of proud of the work that they did and we love to show it off when we can. So, in the museum, every room is separated by theme. Uh, kitchen is obviously something that we all know. There's food and the uh, way that different ethnic cultures shared the way that they dealt with food. This room we call the Native American Land Loss Room. And I want to point out some of the key elements that we have here. The biggest one probably are the maps. The expedition that first brought people up here. And then there are maps that just show us how it was separated from the time of the Native Americans through that early Spanish period into that first Mexican period where California was part of Mexico. You can also see maps here. We have maps that represent on the table everything from the first survey of this area through the world maps of the time, that time when they thought that California was actually a separate island, or the maps that told the king of Spain he better send somebody because they say 
it's unexplored by Europeans. And the king of Spain said, no, that's my place. And they sent this expedition up here. So that's a huge element when you're in this room. Another element is this projection that is running the whole time on the wall. Uh, these are paintings and drawings of the era. There are three types of people who are highlighted in this room. There are the Spanish who came up here. And so in that corner is just a little exhibition that shows you the way of life in this specific area was all about the cattle ranch. So we have some things that show you that, including a beautiful representation of the Peralta sword, which says on one side, please don't draw this without good reason. And on the other side, it says, don't put it back without honor. It's a wonderful piece. Uh, we don't know a lot about Native American life. We have these drawings and paintings. In addition, we also have a little exhibition of things that have been passed down through oral history. But there are a few things that are really authentic to this house. And one of them is in this case. When they were making the park outside, they had to stop all the construction because they started finding these pieces. And the archaeologist said, wait, that's important stuff. Turns out they had found the garbage pit, which is great if you're trying to get information about how people live. So we know from that pit, for example, that they were trading with boats, ships that came into the bay from all over the world. Um, often, questions will come up about the Native American life here. And especially because if you've done any reading about it, or you've just heard, in general, in America, life was not easy for the Native American. So that was the Native American land loss room. This is the Peralta land loss room. Just kind of gauge where your tourist is. How are they feeling? And let them have a moment to kind of look around. There are all kinds of wonderful photos and things that you can allow people to just sort of check out for themselves. And if you're ever having trouble knowing what something is, like what's this about the gold rush? Oh, it says right there, the population expanded a hundred times. So throughout the house, we have all kinds of little things that will help prompt you. Don't be afraid to take a moment, check something out, and then go ahead and tell the people about it. It's always great to say, that's a good question. Let me check. I, mean, I always ask the question, what happened in 1848 that's so important? Well, you might have to prompt a little bit, but you find out it's the gold rush, of course. And suddenly people from all over the world came here, people of all backgrounds and all cultures. Well, not all backgrounds. Mostly people who didn't have any money or didn't have anything. And they came here, and so the population explodes by a hundred times in five years. It grows huge. So in the Peralta land loss room, you get a lot of um, photos and documents, things that come from that era. And it kind of talks about how they went from this huge 45,000 acre cattle ranch to 36 acres to six acres. The important thing to know is that the original land grant, which came from the King of Spain, was given to Luis Peralta, who had been a young soldier coming up here. Well, by the time things got settled here, he was a prosperous man in San Jose, and he wasn't leaving that to come up here. So he asked his four sons to run the business up here, and the business was a cattle ranch. Ships from all over the world came into the bay, and they traded with them for hides and tallow, the, the grease that was made into candles. The Spanish, these folks that actually were born in our hemisphere, I always find it to be strange that they call themselves the Spanish, when none of them were born in Spain, but they were born in New Spain, this territory which was called New Spain. And so their father, who got this land, land grant, heard about the crazy people crawling up in the hills looking for gold and said, my sons, God gave the gold to the Americans. If he wanted the Spanish to have it, he would have shown it to us. So you should just stay on your ranch and raise grain and your cattle, and that's your goal. Thousands of people, tens of thousands of people start coming to this area. And they go to San Francisco, which you know is a little tiny place, and they make their way across the bay, and it's beautiful. It's green, it's sunny, and there's dinner just walking right by you. They, started grabbing the cattle. People started setting up little houses and squatting. And the brothers didn't know what to do about it. The brothers were stuck. So they actually went to court, but it took many years. So my favorite maps in the whole house are these two maps because it shows the way it was when they were running their cattle ranch and the way it was 
By the time they went through all the court system and they proved, they had to keep getting documentation and keep getting more paperwork to prove this was their land, hundreds, maybe thousands of people were living here with deeds to property that they bought from unscrupulous people like the first mayor of Oakland. He was one of those guys who leased land from the Peraltas and then turned around and subdivided it and sold it. So the people he sold it to had legal documents, they had deeds, they paid good money, and the court said, you can't kick those people off, but you can sue the guy who sold it to them, unless somebody sold it to him, and then somebody sold it to him. And so by the time you get back, you've got all these people living in here in the land with legal documentation, and the court said you can't kick them all out. So the Peraltas went from 45,000 acres to 36 acres, which you think would be bad enough. But if you'll notice in the corner, there's a beautiful picture of this daughters of the Peralta family. There were five daughters. There were four brothers, five daughters. And some smart lawyer went to them and said, what did you get out of this deal? The brothers got the land. What did you get? You should sue them to get your fair share. And we actually have a copy of the letter from the brothers saying, no, and it was published. Don't, please don't sue us. Because they didn't have any money at that point. The cattle ranch was, cattle ranch was pretty much defunct. They had no real money. All they were able to do was trade land. But the court case went through and they won. Or rather, the lawyers won. Nobody had any money, so even though the sisters won the suit, they had to pay it off in land. The brothers had to pay their lawyers off in land. So you go from 45,000 acres to 36 acres to six acres to now all that's left is this park. Our changing exhibit room is, as it says, changing. Um, we have exhibits that can sit here for maybe up to two years. Uh, it started off when I was first training with a Cambodian exhibit, which was wonderful. Who knew that there were refugees from Cambodia and Oakland? Well, they certainly did, and they live in this neighborhood. So uh, we wanted to include their experience here, how they got here. Um, and it was a wonderful way to talk about Oakland because these folks came over as immigrants and then they had families and they raised their kids. These kids who were raised in Oakland, like every other teenager in Oakland, but every time they went home, they were like, how come we are different? And how come you talk different? And we wear different clothes and we eat different foods. Um, so there were, as part of that exhibit, some wonderful photos and um, you know, little photo essay things about how these young guys started to find out about their culture and came to appreciate what it meant to be a part of Oakland, but from someplace else. It's very much a part of the museum and our mission to talk about how these cultures come together. Uh, there are a couple of exhibits that are in here right now. This is actually the last part of an exhibit that had been here. And um, it focused on the African-American experience. But the thing I love most about it, and I wanted to point out, is if you'll notice, there's this huge horse here. And it's a lot larger than a real horse, obviously. But if you know the way the Spanish first came to the Americas, uh, it was on horseback. They came over on ship and then they conquered it with horses. Uh, the exhibit that's in here currently is our Home and Away exhibit. And it talks about the uh, California prisons. There's a whole movement going on in the country and California is definitely a part of it to talk about all the folks that we have locked up. Because when you lock up somebody, you're not just removing them from society, you're denying their family them. If they have children, those children are denied them. The community they come from, the schools, the, the jobs, that void that is created every time we lock people up. When they come back, are they ready? Are we ready to accept them back? And so this exhibit is to, a way to, for us to just raise the consciousness. Because what's been happening is that these people feel quiet and embarrassed. They don't want to talk about what happened. So this is sort of just giving permission to say, yeah, we know. And we can't wait for you to join us. Come back. We've got a place for you. So Home and Away is that exhibit. And it focuses on everything from youth projects that we've had to interviews with the community. Um, and it's actually connected to a, an ongoing art project to try and raise this awareness and see if we can do a better job of dealing with all the people in our community. So the final room in the exhibit is our story, is what we call it, our story room. Or 
more specifically, your story. Uh, we've talked about all the different cultures that have come through here and how people have come together. You, or the people that you're giving the tour to, have just joined that group. You are now a part of it. So there are a number of elements in this room that are, it's useful to point out. The big obvious ones are the family trees. We have the Peralta family tree. We have family tree of some of the Native American people who are here. Um, the other thing you can see on the wall are the interviews with current neighbors. And hear a little bit about what it means for them to be here. And then over in the corner is a map. And we've asked people, and kids are always great about this, so if they're young people, you definitely want to invite them to grab a post-it and see if they can mark on the map where they come from or where their family comes from. And we ask everybody to write a little something in our book. How did you get here or how did your family get here? So that you can join that story because as we say, history is not a dead thing. History is alive and it's constantly evolving. It's constantly growing. So we want to add you in to our history. You are now a part of it. We want to make sure that we get you into it. So if you'll take a moment, you know, invite folks to take a moment and fill that out. We also have a couple of clipboards and I know it can feel awkward to ask people to do things, but if you just make the offer and they say no, that's fine. Ask them if they'd be willing to just fill, fill out a quick survey. It helps us get funding and it helps us to improve the program here. So if there was something they saw they wanted to know more about or something that they saw that they thought could be better in some way, this is a way for them to give us feedback. We really appreciate that.